Good evening, everybody. On behalf of CISGRIP and the Atlantic community, I'd like to welcome you to Aware for All Atlanta. My name is Hope Ventricelli, and I am the manager of events and community engagement with CISGRIP. CISGRIP, or the Center for Information and Study on Clinical Research Participation, is a nonprofit focused on education for the public about clinical research. CISGRIP does not conduct or recruit for trials, but we believe in education before participation, and tonight's Aware for All program is a great first step. I'm especially excited to have several days of really exciting program this week to share different perspectives of those involved with clinical research. So today we'll be focusing on an overview of the clinical research process. And tomorrow night you'll hear inspiring stories from individuals who have participated in clinical trials. And Thursday night, you'll have the opportunity to learn from those on the professional side of research. In a moment, I'll turn it over to Rabia Dadu, clinical research associate with the Center of Health and equity transformation to give an overview of clinical research and answer questions from each of you in the audience. But first, to make sure this program is a meaningful educational experience for you, we ask for your feedback. We'll have some great raffle prizes this evening, and the way to enter is by answering the poll questions that will pop up on your screen and or by submitting questions through the Q&A box below. And we understand that you may want to submit questions anonymously, and you should feel free to do so. Though to earn a raffle entry through the Q&A option, we do need to know who you are. So if you prefer, you can send us an email to awareforall at syscript.org. But let's start with an easy poll to test out the feature. And one should have just popped up on your screen right now that reads, I am participating in the webinar as a member of the public or a caregiver, a member of an exhibiting organization, or a professional involved or associated with clinical trials. So we'll have a couple moments here to answer these questions. Another moment here. Awesome. Well, thank you to everyone who was able to answer that. And don't forget to ask questions during the presentation for another chance to be entered into the raffle. So I wanted to take a moment to thank our generous Aware for All sponsors, the Allergy and Asthma Network, Georgia NCORP, I Research Atlanta and Praxis Precision Medicines, as well as every wonderful community organization that has collaborated with us and provided educational content that you can find in our informational exhibit center. And a special thanks as always to our WEAR Industry Consortium, Biogen, CSO Bearing, EMD Serono, Genentech, Acuvia, Janssen, Novartis, Otsuka, Pfizer, and WCG. Without your help and support, this program would not have been possible. And these organizations help to spread the word about the Aware for All program. You can visit many of these groups in the IEC by visiting our website, awareforall.org, and you can revisit the Informational Exhibit Center whenever you'd like, and it'll include a link to this in our follow-up email after the program. So let's get started. Uh, you can download a digital handbook right from our website as well, and you will also receive a link to download the handbook after the event. And poll question number two should have just popped up on your screen. And how would you rate your knowledge of clinical research? You might know a little, you might know a lot, or you might never have heard of clinical research before tonight. Again, that question is, how would you rate your knowledge of clinical research? Another moment here for everybody to have the opportunity to answer. Wonderful. And it is my sincere pleasure to welcome Rabia Dadu, Clinical Research Associate with the Center for Health Equity Transformation. Over to you, Rabia. Thank you so much, Hope. Uh, what a wonderful introduction. I um, have to give a special shout out to, I saw one of your sponsors is Northside Hospital. My daughter was born there uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. So, so great to see that they're supporting this. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, welcome to Aware for All in Atlanta. Uh, we're thrilled to have you and uh, for learning more about clinical trials today. Um, so this program again is brought to you by Syscript. 
and the Center for Health, for, sorry, the, which stands for the Center for Information and Study on Clinical Research Participation, uh, with support from those lovely organizations you saw before. The goal is to help everyone understand the clinical research process, which includes risks and benefits of participating. Um, as Hope mentioned, I, I'm, I'm with the Center for Health Equity Transformation. I put it up here with the side, um, the logo, and if you want to follow us, you can you can uh, find us by searching online Feinberg Chet. That's F E I N B E R G C H E T, and it's the top search result uh, to learn more about our organization. And uh, this um, really, if you, anyone's ever taken, I'm sure people have um, allergy medicine or pain reliever, Tylenol, what have you, um, you can thank a clinical research participant for that because around the world, people are living longer and healthier lives um, because of these selfless individuals who take part in clinical research trials. These trials help us find ways to prevent, treat, and even cure certain medical conditions. And, um, you know, it may sound cliche, but but they truly are medical heroes because without them, we would not be where we are at today with every medical advance that you get to see and, and take part of in the hospital. Uh, so what is clinical research? We're in part one. So at Syscript, um, I'll say we believe in study volunteers are important partners in, in the research process. Um, that's why our motto is education before participation, right? And partnerships work best when everyone understands the overall goal, what may be expected of them, how they are protected throughout the process, that's very important. And this also includes clinical researchers. The information medical experts learn from clinical trials improves public health and can even save lives. Uh, so what do we learn from studies, right? It all starts with these questions that we ask, you know, how does a disease progress and how can it be prevented um, how well does a new drug work or not work? Um, you know, why does my uncle do well on this medication, um, but my, my mother doesn't? Is this, you, you see these differences in the real world, and the answers that we get from really tailoring medications happen in, in the research studies that we see. Um, and also questions like, you know, where do you, does where you live affect your health? Um, and the only way to answer these kinds of questions is with the help of participants uh, hopefully people who are on this call are, are participants or would like to, are interested in becoming clinical research participants. What is a clinical trial? Well, I'll put it uh, plainly that it's a carefully designed study in which a participant may be asked to take a new drug or treatment so that researchers can answer a specific medical question. Um, these are questions like, is the treatment safe, right? Um, does it improve a certain medical condition? Does it have side effects? How much should people take? Is it any better than any medicines that are currently on the market or available? Now, because researchers are studying new treatments, there are risks to participants in the clinical trial. However, something valuable is always learned from clinical research studies that improve public health and could potentially lead to uh, game-changing treatments. Um, I'll add one asterisk to the game-changing mantra, which we do hear a lot in the media. You, on headline news, you do see the game-changing as something relating to a research study. I would just um, caveat that, you know, look into the study and learn about what it is that they've actually found in the study, which you could usually um, glean from the article published, um, the, the news article, you don't have to go into a scientific journal and read the 10 page article, but I think you, you get to know kind of what, what is um, the real takeaway from that. All right, uh, and then next thing, a clinical trial, yeah, is not the same as standard of care. This is important to understand because being in a clinical trial is not the same as going to your doctor uh, for your normal routine care. You know, when you go to your doctor, they give you a treatment that has already been tested uh, and approved by the government, um, depending on, you know, if it's a federal and drug administration, FDA approved drug or treatment um, or other institutions. And this is called routine or standard care. That's the, uh, the key difference there. Um, I don't have to tell you that people are different, right? Um, even within families, right? People are different. So you can't fully understand something by studying just one group of people. Uh, gender, age, ethnicity, all these affect the way people respond to diseases and treatments. Uh, for example, Alzheimer's uh, happens twice as often in women than in men. Type 2 diabetes and asthma are more common in people who are Black or African American descent. Uh, Hispanic, Asian, and white women are more likely to develop osteoporosis. 
so for many years, uh, most clinical trials um, have included white men only, you know, specifically in, a, in an age range of 18 to 65. And this meant that the information we got and collected um, in those trials was not complete. It just, uh, it, could, it could not tell us how treatments affected other groups. Uh, but today, clinical trials welcome the participation of all people. Uh, I would say encourage, because really it's super important that we do get diversity in clinical trials. Uh, and they're closely monitored for their safe and uh, ethical treatment. Uh, let's talk about the importance of diversity. Um, so to hammer this home, really, it's health professionals are more aware now than ever the need to have diverse populations in clinical research. Um, as a community, we are taking steps to break down uh, participation barriers, and improve diversity, and pave the way to a healthier future for everyone. Um, this is not just lip service. I think really a lot of uh, universities, hospitals, institutions are taking uh, proactive steps to encourage and, and, and make sure that um, studies that are underrepresented um, are, are going to consistently demonstrate a high willingness to participate in clinical research studies. So individuals within these communities um, have said that a lack of access to clinical trials is the primary reason why they don't want to participate. This includes outreach and communications that fail to reach them. You know, health and research professionals not asking them to participate in the first place, clinical trials that are too far away, and participation requirements that are too difficult to follow, frankly. Uh, you may remember some past abuses, uh, of course, the infamous Tuskegee Civil Study where they uh, in fact, it did not treat those with syphilis um, during the treatment, uh, black men for many years. Uh, the story of Henrietta Lacks, um, which are now known as HeLa cells, one of the most commonly used cells, in, cell lines rather, in scientific research. Um, and these studies experiment on, on patients without their consent and were not compensated for their participation. So just to, the sort of closer is that this mistrust that is, exists within the community is warranted. And we should address that up front and talk about all the steps and, and things that have been taken, um, you know, in people's lifetime today, they've uh, experienced this, this um, mistreatment that they um, should ask those questions and understand what steps are taken to protect them. Um, yes, thank you. Clinical trials. Okay, so it's a four phase process. Um, I like how this slide puts it real nice and clean and easy. So. Um, we'll talk a bit about it. Uh, so clinical trials move forward uh, in these phases um, and how long it typically takes to advance a new treatment. Uh, clinical trials begin with a small number of participants. And the goal of that small number is to really just learn more about the safety of the new treatment. Next step is clinical trials recruit larger numbers of participants to test how well the treatment works and help researchers learn more about its safety. This part could take several years uh, and researchers continue, continue to study treatments after they have been approved um, these trials usually involve a large number of participants. In these trials, researchers look at real world experience and check to see if the treatment works well over a long period of time. So it's really ongoing uh, and um, they do have these very strict criteria for each phase they go through. Um, so you've probably heard a lot, uh, <laughs> a lot of news, a lot uh, every day uh, about the development of vaccines and treatments for COVID-19, of course. Um, vaccines and treatments for infectious diseases usually take nine or 10 years to develop. It seems like a long time, but it is necessary for understanding if a treatment is safe and effective at specific dosage levels for, for people and, of course, adults and children. Um, however, the clinical trial process for COVID-19 treatments and vaccines is moving and has moved uh, at a much faster pace and, and may produce promising therapies in a few years. And we've seen those come to light uh, recently with Pfizer and the treatment of COVID-19. And of course, the different vaccines that are FDA approved um, for, for the uh, adult population uh, and now children. Um, and, you know, this was, it's just important to note that this is not just based on, um, you know, we didn't start from zero. This was based on a lot of prior research and scientific studies in mRNA vaccines. Um, so this is all the work that you're seeing um, come out from the scientific community. And of course, the pandemic has mobilized much higher levels of coordination between you know, businesses and companies and governments and agencies, which really helps speed up the process. So it uh, broke down those silos that uh, usually do exist in the um, community sometimes. Uh, next slide, please. Great, so clinical trial sponsors. Um, this is important is how the work gets done. 
So uh, government is a big sponsor. Um, the federal government uh, invests, um, the National Institute of Health in particular, invests in research studies across the nation and, and the world. Um, and that includes academic medical centers like, like ours and Northwestern University, it includes pharmaceutical companies, biotechnology companies, or medical device companies. So really, um, there's a rigorous grant application um, that each of these uh, uh, um, awardees have to go through and it's pretty competitive, but you could see it's so important that we do get these studies funded. Part two. So we made it this far. Thank you for thank you for coming along. So this is about the research team and informed consent. Um, so this is really important when we train our research team to go out in the community and do recruitment. It's just so important that we start from a, a fundamental understanding of the research process and protections in place. So they go through a lot of hours and hours of training and also um, uh, partner with other experienced research members to interact with people, both in the hospital setting and community setting, because they interact with many different people. Um, and like a member of like a sports team, you know, we have coaches, players, and referees, and each person has an important role to play. The principal investigator, uh, which is my boss, uh, Dr. Melissa Simon, uh, is like the head coach, and um, they are responsible for organizing and leading the trial as well as recording and analyzing the data. Um, the, the principal investigator or PI is like we like to call it. Uh, they follow a playbook, which is uh, called the clinical trial protocol. And that protocol basically is a set of instructions that everyone on the team must follow. That's, um, that's, that's very standard across all research studies. Um, the next person, next sort of player in this team will be a clinical research coordinator. Um, they're like an assistant coach and they uh, help the PI. They help day-to-day uh, -day activities for the, at the research site. So it's anywhere from you know, compensating participants to ensuring that protocols are up to date and uh, working closely with the PI and the main contact is the main contact for participants. So it's a very front-facing um, position. The next uh, role would be a um, volunteer protection. So these are like the referees of the research study. And these are organizations that help protect the safety of participants. Um, these referees make sure the teams follow the rules, review the trial before it starts, and keep participants safe. So the number and type of referees in a trial depends on the research being conducted. Volunteer protections. This is also so important. So we, every clinical trial is reviewed, approved, and supervised by an independent local ethics committee. Um, you know, our university has, a, has an institutional review board. Um, this committee makes sure a trial is ethical and fair, and there is not too much risk for participants. During the trial, researchers must let the committee know if there are any changes in the trial plan or if participants experience serious injuries or side effects. Those are like adverse events that we need to report immediately within a time frame. The ethics committee uh, can also end a trial if it feels that if the participants are not safe. So they really are there as the safeguards. In fact, today I'm responding to the IRB uh, about some uh, advertisements we want to put up on, on uh, in Chicago here. And, you know, they had some concerns to make sure that it's that we, we uh, make it clear that it's research focused uh, and so there's a lot of nuance that's involved, but they're there to ensure that those protections are, are kept and held. Uh, volunteer protection. So again, referees from the federal government are also involved. Uh, agencies like the FDA or in Europe, the European Medicines Agency review trials, uh, inspect research centers and monitor research groups to make sure they are following federal guidelines. Uh, these agencies have the final say in whether or not a treatment is approved in the end. Uh, volunteers, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, such an important piece of this, like without the volunteers, the players, you can't have the sports team. So they are the most important members of the team is, is the participants. Um, thank you to those who've already participated in the clinical trial. Um, I really do appreciate your time and effort in doing that. They are the, the players in the field and uh, we need all different types of people to participate in clinical research. So research can include, um, this is very important because this comes up a lot, it's sick or healthy individuals. You don't have to be uh, diagnosed with a certain condition to participate in a clinical trial and be helpful. And uh, let's not forget the friends, family, and your supporters, which are like the fans in this sports metaphor. 
Uh, they're also important and they um, can be your support system while you're taking part in a clinical trial. You should consult with them, of course, before you take part, make sure that they understand what you're getting into and they can help you come up with questions to ask your doctor. In the end, it is your job to make the final decision if you will participate in the trial. Eligibility criteria. So um, everyone has a chance to participate in research. You just have to find the clinical trial that is right for you. Um, just like in sports, clinical trials have um, these eligibility criteria. These are guidelines that indicate who can or cannot be in a trial. Um, these eligibility criteria ensure that the clinical trial is studying the right people under the right conditions. Um, if you're considering a trial, be honest with the researchers about your health and health status. Lying or hiding information to get into a trial could endanger your safety and harm the research. And I would say also don't take it personally. If, if they say, you know, you're, you're being screened for a study, turns out your you know, BMI your, because of your height and weight doesn't meet the criteria and you don't get to participate. Um, it, it, it's very, um, it can seem arbitrary, but it's important for the study to, to adhere to those protocols and not sort of just ma make a pass on a person just because they don't fit the, the strict eligibility criteria. Um, okay, and then the next, sorry, I was just looking at the questions and seeing if it, anything that came up. All right, informed consent. This is another important part. Um, you know, let's assume that the coaches uh, say you're eligible to play the game, right? You made it past the screening. The next question you have to ask yourself is, do you choose to play? You cannot say whether or not you want to participate without understanding the rules of the game and what your responsibilities are as a player. So you have to ask questions like, you know, how long the game will last? What are the risks and benefits of playing? The informed consent process is designed to answer all these questions and is required by the FDA and the local ethics committee. Um, informed consent is one of the most important parts of research and it's a team effort uh, and you're going to hear you're going to hear it a lot. Um, remember that informed consent is an ongoing process uh, throughout the whole trial, not just the one single event where you sign your name and date that in consent form. It's really always asking the questions if you're not sure if something you overlooked in the in that process of, of signing your consent, you um, you ask the question and then you also get to make that decision later on to revoke your consent. It's not a one time and done situation. Um, it is ongoing. But just the important part is that make sure you do read and understand uh, before you sign the consent form, ideally that you understand everything involved um, and, you know, and, and get a copy of that consent form so you can review it uh, later on. Uh, so rights and responsibilities. If you participate in a clinical trial, you have rights. Uh, you have the right to understand the purpose, benefits, risks, and side effects of the clinical trial. You have the right to ask questions and discuss your concerns. It's important for participants to ask questions until they fully understand the trial. And that's different for every person. Sometimes it could take, I've had consent uh, sessions go from five quick minutes online, you know, we're doing virtual now with, with most of them, to uh, up to an hour of asking questions and follow-up questions. So we our job is to make sure that um, every participant is fully informed before signing. Uh, most importantly, you have the right to quit the trial at any time for any reason. It can be any reason. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be justified um, by any person except yourself. <clears throat> and then the research staff will help uh, you do this safely. We are at part three, folks. All right. Thank you so much for, for staying with me. Um, someone asked a question about the health fair, to find online health fair. I'm sure someone can answer that. Um, in the chat. Uh, so deciding to take part, <coughs> excuse me, in a clinical trial is ultimately a personal decision. Uh, what's right for you may not be right for someone else. So understanding the study design, um, researchers set up their studies so their trial will be fair. They also want their research to be accurate and unbiased. They don't want their own ideas about what they think should happen in trial influence the results. Um, <clears throat> To set up fair studies, participants may be randomly split. So randomly being like a flip of a coin, right? Heads or tails into a different trial uh, in different groups. So in this case, the researcher and the participants do not get to decide which, which group the participants will be in. And that's called a randomized trial. Okay, sometimes the participants do not know which treatment they're receiving. Uh, when the participants or researchers in the clinical study uh, both don't know which treatment each participant gets, that's called blinding. Uh, in some trials, researchers will use a placebo 
a placebo, if you heard of this, it's like a trial treatment, but it does not have any medicine in it. Um, so it's like a fake out, uh, you know, sugar pill kind of thing. Um, I'm sure all of us have used that with our children with, uh, with certain things and it works sometimes. Um, sometimes a placebo in the form of a drug is referred to as the sugar pill, right? Um, so uh, what's interesting is that even though the placebo has no medicine in it, um, we do see in research results that there are times when people are taking a placebo improve or feel better during a trial. And that's, that's what you hear a lot about is the placebo effect. All right, so possible benefits. These are important things to consider when you decide to participate in a clinical trial. Here are some of the reasons why you might consider getting involved. Um, you do get access to new treatments that are not publicly available, um, which might be uh, a reason. Advancing science and helping others, you know, the altruistic, like, you know, the greater good um, for those who don't have the same, who have the same condition as you, or, or, or you know, you're healthy and, and they need a control group and you're that participant volunteer. That's super important. Um, and of course, receiving free and close healthcare monitoring is another plus if you get additional, um, you know, workup or, or tests done. Uh, some, but not all, clinical trials will pay for travel costs and for time and commitment. Uh, <clears throat> these amounts, I have to say, they can vary widely. Um, so the, the benefits in it are in addition to the help you provide for health research. But definitely do ask about, about those. Uh, risks involved. So this is also another important thing. We weigh the pros and cons of participating in a clinical trial. Um, all research involves risks, even if it's minimal risk. Uh, they can be physical risks. They can be, you know, a sick participant. You, you may not get better. Uh, you might feel uncomfortable um, or your symptoms may get worse. Uh, there is also the emotional risk. Um, the trial itself can be demanding and, and participation may be stressful to go back to multiple visits. Uh, financially, too, there may be out-of-pocket expenses such as childcare or missing work to attend those, those uh, research appointments. And when you agree to participate in research, you're giving permission uh, for researchers to collect information about you, which um, goes to the privacy and confidentiality uh, risk, which I have to say, you know, every, every research organization um, must go through extensive, I know for hours, extensive um, IT or, or um, information technology standards where we're encrypting and hashing and de-identifying information uh, and, and uh, placing all information on a private and, and uh, locked server. But that said, there's always this risk, even it's not zero, but there is a risk of, of information that might um, be leaked. Things to consider. So <clears throat> uh, participating it takes time and effort as mentioned. You can work with the trial staff to try to accommodate your schedule. Um, the trial may end early. Even if you want to continue to participate, your doctor, the referees, as mentioned before, that, or the company making the new drug can stop the trial at any time. So all those are possible outcomes that, before you participate. Um, education before participation. So this is the model that we talk about. Um, unfortunately, many participants drop out of studies. Um, it happens. Uh, because they don't fully understand <clears throat> what they were signing up for. So here are some tips uh, if you are in a trial or, or thinking about it. You know, first of all, do your homework. Um, read about information provided by the trial staff. You can even go online to learn more about the potential treatment being studied. A quick um, search online will, will get you the information you need. Uh, take your time. There is absolutely nothing wrong with asking a researcher to slow down um, when, when explaining the study. Ask, ask questions, bring up any concerns with the trial staff. And those questions can be via you know, email, uh, chat or text. We have a chat text open with our participants. Um, any way you feel comfortable and bring up your concerns with the staff, your doctor and your friends and family. Um, also, I encourage you to bring your family or friend to ask questions too. If you decide to join a trial, you should feel confident that you've made an informed choice. You should feel comfortable that the clinical trial staff will support you and answer all your questions. All right, uh, where should we, where should you go to learn more? Um, well, there are a few places um, and also a lot of things to consider when you decide to participate in a clinical trial. I think today's presentation really was just to give you an introduction. Um, some of it you've heard, probably heard before. Some of it might seem um, more in depth, but it's an important first step. I think the next step is really um, look, know where to look. Uh, we've listed some of these uh, places to start. You can, of course, talk to your doctor, talk to your net or your regular um, place you get care. 
Um, you can get information from local research centers, uh, disease advocacy groups, and conferences. Um, of course, this group booth and the uh, Information Exhibit Center will have information. I like uh, uh, researchmatch.org and also trialstoday.org, which is the sister site of, of Research Match. Um, it's more user-friendly um, than clinicaltrials.gov, which is another, of course, great uh, source of information. But if it's your first time going there and you're not used to the, uh, the sort of, uh, it looks more like, a, like you're searching for, a, a, more like a library book, I guess. It's more like a catalog format. It could be not as user-friendly. Um, so I'll just note that as, a, as information. But there are many sources of information to learn more. I encourage you to try all of them. And I uh, just want to end by thanking you all for, for your attention. Um, I just really, uh, I mean, clinical research participants, I mean, they really are medical heroes. Um, you know, without them, medical science can't move forward. We wouldn't be here today uh, we're, and where we are in the pandemic without their participation. Um, on behalf of CISGRIP, you know, thanks to all the millions of people who give the gift of participation in clinical trials each year and to the rest of us who admire them for doing so. We appreciate you taking the time today to learn more about clinical uh, research and the process. And we strongly encourage you to share what you've learned with your family and friends and people throughout your community if they have any questions. So thank you so much for your attention. Awesome, thank you so much, Rabia. Um, I thought we could just run through some of the questions that we've been getting in. Um, but just before we do that, uh, poll question number two should have just popped up on your screen. So if everyone's able to see and answer the question, uh, just quickly, and the Institutional Review Board's role is to make sure that the study is ethical and the rights of welfare of participants are protected. So this is a true or false question. We'll take a few moments to answer this here and just see if you were paying attention during the presentation. Another moment here. All right. Okay. So one of the questions that we hear all the time, Rabia, um, is how to determine if, if the clinical trial is right for you. So if someone's interested in getting involved, what's something that they should, what should their first steps be if they're trying to figure out if this trial is right for them? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a common one we get. So I think the first step is um, talking with your friends and family <clears throat> to understand sort of how it fits, you know, with your, either your condition. Um, but uh, I think the first place, as we mentioned before, is speaking with your doctor or your normal care provider. Um, if, you know, they have any sort of concerns, they might bring that up depending on your, what's going on with your health. Um, and then there's, there's of course, the, the, the research group itself. I think uh, going online and, and doing your research on what's, what the treatment is, what's being investigated, um, taking that information uh, home with you and then talking to your family and friends about it is a great first step. Um, as mentioned before, even if you go down the route of like, well, I don't even know if I'm eligible, you can get screened. And then mm -hmm. if you're not eligible, sort of, okay, then the, the conversation will stop there. But in that process, you get to learn more about the trial too. So it's not that it's not that you start to the process and it's and it's like you're in. You, you it's a, it's a continuous process of, inf of informed consent. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and I know we kind of alluded a little bit in the slides as well, but it's also something really important to us at Cisgrip, um, and I'm sure many of our audience members is the importance of diversity. And you know, we often say that health is not one size fits all. So what are some things that are really important, especially with your group, but just across the, across the board about reaching diverse populations to help them get more educated or involved with clinical research? Right, oh, so, so you're asking where, where we can go to get help with that? Yeah, why, you know, talk about why diversity is so important. And you oh, know, there's people who, you know, there's misconceptions that are out there amongst different populations, um, but yeah. just to kind of drive home that point of why, you know, as we say, it's not one size fits all. We need everybody to participate. Uh, yeah, yeah. This, this comes up a lot, I think. So um, really, it's, it's just meeting people where they are. I mean, we have a study now that we partner with, the, with public libraries in Chicago, and we go out in the community and uh, we, we both use librarians um, and we talk to library uh, readers there to discuss diversity in clinical trials specifically. And what comes up again and again is this um, people remember and, uh, you know, um, you know, with, with warranted um, cause for concern that in the past there have been 
uh, exploitations uh, of underrepresented groups, um, mm -hmm. minorities, and and everything else. So really, just talking about it, talking like how, what uh, steps were taken to address those concerns, what steps we do now as researchers, because it, it's like for us, it's our day to day. But for people um, who don't know what goes on behind the scenes, it's important to understand that we have all these protections in place, and um, the diversity is so important because all these treatments you see on the market today, um, they're based on a pretty narrow group of the population. It's not representative of what the country looks like. And that is not good for medications in the end. Um, mm -hmm. Hence side effects, hence, you know, not having uh, as, as good of a, a treatment effect um, for one group versus the other. So the more diverse a group can be in a clinical trial for a treatment, the better it will be for more people um, that, that get prescribed that in the end, because we're all gonna end up in the doctor's office I'll be there one day, you know, like taking my blood pressure medication. And I want the medication to work as best as it can from, you know, based on my biology and, and genetics and everything else. So I think it's really just understanding the issues there and, and getting over um, some, some, I, we have a nice, like, uh, you know, myth versus fact kind of myth busting thing. Cause there are a lot, uh, there are a lot of myths out there. Um, yeah. And yeah, you know, unfortunately, it gets propagated uh, on social media and the rest. But it's important that we we talk about them and address them. Um, yeah, yeah. And and kind of speaking of that, what are what are some of the biggest myths that you hear or misconceptions from people, whether the patients or the public population, about participating in research? Uh, yeah, I think I think there are. Um, so I think the most common one we get is, uh, we talked about this in the presentations, like once you join the study, you're in, you can't change your mind, like you're locked in. Right. Not true, not true at all. You can, you can say, no, thank you. You write an email, you make the call, say, hey, you know what? I changed my mind, I'm out. And you're out, you know? And, and there might be a process of like, um, you know, making sure that your information gets removed from the study, et cetera. But um, uh, so that, that's, that's one, that's a common myth. Another one I'll say is, um, uh, that if you donate samples, so some some studies will take your blood and urine samples or things like that. That someone who's going to be for sure identify you that way. And um, the you know what we talk about that is like these samples that you get that we obtain, um, they don't contain personal information. Um, there is a, a special code that's assigned to each sample, and then that sample is also hashed or like shuffled or mixed up. So it's mm -hmm. like um, yeah. So what you see, what we see sort of on the, on like our research database is not what's on the sample, if that makes sense. It's, it's, there's a, a um, what's called a, um, <clears throat> a, a code, a key code that's in a secure uh, physical place where the person have to, so they have to like go through like four levels of security to match those, which is very, very difficult. And it would not, you know, even if they get that, they can't make sense of that sample. Um, yeah, I, I think honestly, like uh, a lot, a lot I miss. Another one is, um, oh, right. So I think another myth we do get is, um, that if you get, if you do not get placed, like we talked about randomized trials, if you don't get placed in that treatment group, then you won't get the right medicine or treatment for your disease. And one of these things, depending on design of the study, when they randomize, the reason they're doing that is they want to see, you know, the, this is the gold standard of, of clinical trials that you have a randomized uh, study that's double blind. So that mm -hmm. you know, one group gets the treatment and one group gets routine care. But, but the fact is that the people who get routine care will still be taken care of. You're not going to be neglected. Um, and you won't have a worse outcome than uh, now a worse outcome being like by, by standard of care. If so, something does right. happen where they're monitoring you on a regular basis and they see like, oh, this person's not, not, you know, sort of an outlier or something's happening, then they take action. And then, you know, there's a process for that. But mm -hmm. that's another myth and, and, and also a valid concern for people when they uh, participate in clinical trials. Yeah, that's great. Um, and somebody asked, uh, so if they've never been asked to participate in a study, how they can find information on their own. I know we kind of talked about some of those resources before, but was there anything else that you wanted to add to that? I think, yeah, this is interesting because I feel like um, some people, when they're in, they're in like five trials. And they've done, like, they've, like, <laughs> they've sort of broken, right. broken that seal of like, oh, yeah, I, I can help out here and here because they start to learn more and more about other trials when they're in one. I, mm -hmm. I think um, it, yeah, it depends a lot on your environment, right? Like I have never been asked by my doctor to participate in clinical trial, for example. And I, and I go to my doctor at an academic medical center, um, <laughs> but I haven't been asked. Uh, so it's really, it, a lot of it does take initiative. Um, we also learn from word of mouth, people and family and friends talk to each other about a, a clinical trial. The places that I, that I listed, um, 
you know, clinicaltrials.gov, researchmatch.org. There's also ways you can get on these registries where um, then you, you put in your information, some basic information about your age, et cetera, uh, conditions, and then you're on the registry and you get emailed when they think there's a study that kind of fits uh, or you think you'd be interested in. Um, and then it, it's not as uh, like, you know, I'm on a registry, I get an email like maybe once a week which, you know, so it's not as much as, you know, and of course you can always opt out if you don't like getting those emails, but then you get to choose which one you want to learn more about. And then they let you know um, kind of what's, what's being studied and who needs help. Yeah, that's great. And I think also um, CISGROUP has a great resources, our uh, search clinical trials team that you can reach out to us at any time and we can help to find trials that you might be eligible for or what's in your area as well. So um, anybody who's interested in that can always check out our website and reach out to any member of our team for more resources. Um, and another really interesting question we just got in was, um, how might you suggest somebody prepare um, for meeting with a nurse or a clinical trial professional if they're getting involved with the trial? Is there anything that they should feel free to bring to the appointment or questions they should be asking? Uh, I think um, the important thing is, um, if you have someone that you that you are with or that you trust as a, a, a friend or family member, you can bring them along. That's that's totally okay. Because um, mm -hmm. sometimes you know you're alone with that research uh, researcher, and, and and there's this sort of dynamic that happens, like you know, doctor patient relationship. It feels like where mm -hmm. there's this position, person in an authority position, and you might feel hesitant to ask questions. And um, that's where it helps to do homework. We talked about before is like um, searching online. That you have questions, and then even as you're being told sort of what's what's going to happen in this study, and then you're there, and then you're not exactly sure if you should participate, you could take your time and take it home with you. You don't have to sign on the spot. Um, mm -hmm. If the if the researcher seems um, you know pushy or or like even if like something seems off to you, I think you should then take the moment to like to make sure you ask the right questions, and then if it's not to your satisfaction, then um, it is a personal decision in the end. You have to um, really, um, yeah, rely on, on, your, on yourself and, your, and also your family and friends and talk to your doctor, of course, if there's something that you might be concerned about in participating in a clinical trial. Yeah, that's great. And I know it's been, you know, a crazy couple of years with COVID. How has that affected the work that you've been doing and, and the willingness for people to get involved? Has it been you know, have more hesitancy? Has there been more people who are interested in getting involved because there's been some more information that's out there? What's that look like for you guys? Uh, I, I think this could sort of vary by, by sort of research groups. Um, mm -hmm. For us, because we were doing uh, most of our, most of our studies were, could, could be done remotely. So we made that transition pretty easily. Like we don't, uh, in our current studies, we're not asking people to come in to donate samples. So that's sort of, mm -hmm. take, that makes it a lot easier. Um, but uh, I, I have to say though, it has been difficult in, in recruitment. And that's, I think just by this, the sheer fact that people are not out, weren't out in public and in setting right. typically have that conversation because it is a nuanced conversation. It's not something that we could, you know, quickly in a sound bite or, or little, you know, something to, to let you know, like to participate in clinical research. It's a, it's a difficult, it's, it's not as easy a um, message to get across. Um, mm -hmm over over the internet frankly um but there yeah. are ways that, that you know we're thinking innov innovatively we have um uh, we open up zoom chats we open up uh our like every form of communication we use social media to, to sort of promote it as well and then um so a lot of it's been a back and forth emailing with participants too um and working with our partners to to really understand like how best we can work with them to to reach folks that might be interested in particip participating so um I think, yeah, I think like my colleagues were um, for a while there, they, were, they, they couldn't get into their labs, so they couldn't even start to start to, to recruit, but I'm happy to see it. it is picking up again. People are going back to get their routine care, which is great. You should always, um, you know, if you, if you feel, uh, yeah, you're in a position where you're comfortable and safe to do so. And it's, it's been, I think, improving since. Awesome. Well, I just want to thank you again for your time. This has been so fantastic and so helpful. Um, I think our audience learned a lot. There's been some great questions coming through, which we love to see. Um, but thank you again for your time, Rabia, and for your um, you know, expertise in this subject, if you will.
thank you so much. It was a pleasure to have uh, this opportunity and um, thank you all for, for joining us. I think I look forward to the rest of the exhibits going on. Awesome, thank you so much. And thank you to each of you for joining us this evening. This has been highly informative. Um, we really appreciate your commitment to educating yourself and helping to educate the community. And thanks to everybody who submitted questions through our question box. Um, you can be sure to check out our FAQ section on our website, which will also be linked in our follow-up emails for more information. Um, and we hope this is just the start of the conversation. There are tons of resources available for you to continue to learn, uh, starting with your handbook and our informational exhibit center, where you can explore all different kinds of booths from local and national organizations. And that always stays open. It's on our website indefinitely. You can continue to learn and visit and share. You know, that was a question that somebody got before. So you will get some more information on our website, awareforall.org, um, but it will also be included in your follow-up email as well. Um, and be sure to tune in tomorrow and Thursday, if you can, for our panel discussions and more opportunities to win fun prizes. Um, but we are going to move on to our raffle portion to end the evening. I'm excited for some fun giveaways. Um, and our first exciting offer is a $100 gift card to Kroger. Um, so our winner is David Wall. All right, congratulations, David. You can check your email after this for more information on how to redeem. And we also have a $50 Walgreens gift card. And the winner of our Walgreens gift card is Jesse Kivi. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, but again, both of you check out your emails at the end of this for more information on how to uh, redeem this prize. So very excited for both of you. Congratulations. Um, and just wanted to remind everybody that that informational exhibit center will remain open for the rest of the evening. Um, for the rest of time, frankly, it's always on our website. Um, and we'll have giveaways at the end of every program. So like I mentioned, be sure to tune in tomorrow and Thursday for your chance to win. Um, and in our informational exhibit center, we have a fun kiosk that you can see on the screen here. So we have some fun prizes that are given from our local exhibitors, as well as a $150 Amazon gift card. So that'll be open for the next week. So be sure to check out our informational exhibit center, engage with a lot of those organizations. And if you find that gift, uh, that little kiosk, you are entered into that raffle. Um, we encourage you to visit awareforall.org to access that information center and other resources whenever you'd like. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow and Thursday if you can join us. So have a great evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us.